Welcome back to Straight Facts on Wednesday, joined as ever by Mo Gender, a.k.a. Judge Mo. Uh, and instead of Dan Lawless today, we're joined by the glamorous, the beautiful, the wonderful Kate. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. That makes me nervous. What are you after? <laughs> no, nothing. Jimbo paid me 10 quid to say it. So <laughs> I knew uh, there was a reason. I'm good, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are we both? We're both well? Very good, yep. people. Yeah. Make sure to like, subscribe. Now, let's get the likes up now. And if you're watching this in the replay, you know what to do, right? Before you go on, you're going to in for a great show. Like the video before you even go on for the show, if you're watching this in the replay. If you're watching it now, you know what to do. Let's get the likes up. It doesn't cost you a penny. So just do it. Do it now. Absolutely. We are sponsored by our friends at Brickhouse Nutrition again today. You have to check them out. You have to start taking their products. 100% pure organic food powdered down you put it into your drink it's a great way of getting more than your five a day of nutrients into you you click on the link check out their field of green range it is absolutely tip top i swear that to you right down to little things like your now growth is quicker my hair i know my hair has been redistributed but the thickness in my hair it's better than taking drugs it's better than taking any crap that you you, you know you're getting everywhere else it's full of sludge and chemicals pure organic fruit and veg get your nutrition up check out brick house right well not right now do it at the end of the show but scan the qr code and save it do your shopping later lots to talk about on the show today though lots to go through pep guardiola potentially quitting manchester city reports have come out today we're going to share that with everybody we're going to look at arsenal striker options going into the summer with reports today that eucharist has become the number one target over ivan tony and i'm personally happy about that we're going to be looking at the man. I, I'm calling him him from now because he is him or he is the one, just like Neo, Kobe Mainu after his man of the match performance last night and looking at the more problems at Chelsea uh, that have emerged uh, with Lavia being injured and doctors being uh, ignored, essentially. So loads to go through today, but viewers hit like buttons. Please make sure you are subscribing. And I, I'm actually going to start off with this news. I'm just going to say the statement and I want your opinions. I'm just going to say it now. Kobe Mainu is him. <laughs> That's it. Kobe Mainu's him. You're on mute mode. Yeah, yeah. I was watching the first game when Conor Gallagher played and, and Kobe Mainu came in at the end and I said, what does Conor Gallagher offer than Kobe Mainu with all these years of experience? Nothing. Um, listen, Kobe Mainu is proving everyone that doubted him wrong, including myself, like gaming every week now. The guy, as they said, he's playing way mature than his years. He's playing like at 28 years old, very controlled, composed on the ball. And it doesn't matter that he plays for Man United and all the problems that are happening. He stepped onto the England team and he proved that. You know, when someone plays for a team and you just right away, you know, he belongs. It's This is it. This is, this is someone who can start, who can play in the Euros. It doesn't matter if he plays again in Belgium. He absolutely looked magnificent. I, I watched like his highlights, especially, and um, it was absolutely magnificent. And he's a big asset for Man United. My only problem with him is just that he's a Man United player. That's the only problem. And if they don't fix up, uh, listen, we have seen it with Pogba. We have seen it with this. He is fantastic, but the club has to fix up for this guy to keep developing. To be honest, it's, it's just. But he's absolutely someone that can change. I actually believe that you can build a midfield around the guy. Bun the rest of them. Just build a team around the guy. Build a midfield around the guy. He's that good, to be honest. He's, he's very, very good. And um, maybe you should leave Man United. Why? Oh, controversial. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being controversial. I just don't trust Man United. Unle un until they fix up, until they fix up, I just yeah, don't and it's nothing against it's, you. It's not it's no banter. There's okay. no banter here. The guy's talented, I, I, but it's okay, a Pogba, Pogba I, situation. I get that, but you've got to put that talk on ice right now. That talk's got to be put on ice because the club is going about fixing itself. So I get where you're coming from, but with the likes of Ashworth and Barada and Co coming in, for me, I'm relaxed about this whole United have got to fix themselves approach. I know it, the point stands, but I don't think it's Personally, as a United fan looking at this, this was 12 months ago, 18 months ago, two years ago, I would have concurred 100%. But for me now, we know we're addressing those areas because it's been very widely reported on that we're, we're fixing up. So I'm not worried. I agree with you. That I still think we need to go and buy 
better midfield players than the main who I don't believe in this gateway nonsense that we're going to, we're going to stop his progression. We're going to block his gateway. If you're good enough, you're going to break through. When I say he's him, I am being quite specific to England in that he should be on that plane to Germany without a shadow of a doubt. Doesn't mean he starts every game. Maybe our opinions will change by the, by the time the summer comes, but he was up against a top 10 opponent last night in his first ever start after just 23 professional games. And I mean this with all due respect. I've seen Tom, young Tom Cleverley's. I've seen Harry Winks's. We've seen Conor Gallagher's. We've seen a lot of players be given opportunities due to good league form, go into the England setup and look, meh, okay. We saw Dunk last night, who's experienced, who looks good in the Premier League. Every time I see him play for England, he is half a yard too slow. He doesn't look like an international player. Mainu went in, dominated the midfield, was integral in nearly everything we created. And if, if, our, if our attacking players were a little bit more on point last night, we should have won the game. The midfield and defence, to a large degree, barring the errors from the goalkeeper and Dunk, did their jobs in terms of play. And if you were an alien that came down from outer space, you had no idea who anybody was, you would not have known that Mainu was 18. You would not have known that this was his first start. You would not have known that he's only been playing professional football for 23 games. You would not have seen that last night. And when you see a player do that, and by the way, for me with ease, he is him. He is a player that should be involved in this England setup from now moving forward. Yes, I know a lot of people call him overhyped. I, I don't really understand what people mean by overhyped. The hype is real. This kid has got absolutely everything and can become one of the best midfield players in the world with hard work and the right direction. But as far as the summer's concerned for England, I think last night, in my opinion, should rubber stamp his place in the squad. Not the starting 11 for every game, but in this squad. Because when you think of... I mean, this is the, this is the saddest bit. He only actually got the start because Henderson got injured. This is what's crazy. Yeah. Manager was going to pick Henderson over him last night. That's my biggest concern, is that Southgate still thinks Henderson is better. Henderson's never been this good technically on the ball in his entire career. And now he's old. It's, it's crazy. I don't know what you think uh, as an England fan yourself, Kate, but uh, for me, he's got to be there. I'm not a massive England fan, not going to lie. At the moment, anyway, I am. But at the minute, it's like watching Conte ball most of the time. So I've kind of lost a bit of love for England. I'm not going to lie. But I did watch the game. I've watched the friendlies. Um, and he looks excellent. Um, but we all know that Gareth Southgate likes to play his... his uh, he likes to stick to what he knows, so how much of a chance he'll get. Um, but he certainly deserves to go. I do worry that we're hyping this kid up a bit much. You know, he, he's, he looked good yesterday, but England are crap. They were crap yesterday. They were crap the other day. I, I just, I don't know if it's the system that Southgate plays. I just find them so boring to watch. They just look so average. So for him to stand out isn't a massive feat. But I hope you're right. I hope you're right. He looks brilliant. Um, I just hope, like I say, he doesn't end up believing his own hype. Um, I mean, I saw, I was reading about him. He won a cup when he was 11 and won the most valuable player in the tournament award. And Man United, uh, a scout or something, said that they're billing him up to be the next Pogba, but I think he's going to be the next Beckham. You know, he's got a hell of a lot to live up to. But, yeah, I mean, can, I can only go by what I've seen. And so far, he, he does look very good. Most of what was good last night came from him. He seems to have brilliant awareness of where the ball is. He, he can tackle. He can pass. But, yeah, it'll be a case of watching and seeing. Like I say, I, I hate it when players get built up too much because some of them then start believing their own hype and that's when my, their downfall my, comes yeah, in. My, my, my thing about this, and I compared them before to... As a talented player coming from the academy, Marcus Rashford, when he was 18, I remember the hype. I remember at the age of 20, I think Real Madrid asked about him and Deli Ali, if I'm not mistaken. They wanted both in that time, and Man United said no. This kid, he looks like as talented in his position as Marcus Rashford was at that time. The amount of talent Marcus Rashford had at that time. Yeah, Marcus Rashford now, people talk about him. He isn't this, he isn't that, and that's due to the environment, due to the the stale and all the changes that, that, that the things that happen at Man United I'm just afraid of Kobe Mainu if he and I get what Terry's saying about fixing up and they look like they're hiring the right people and stuff like that 
But this Man United have to win. And I'm I'm looking at this kid. He has a contract runs until 2027, if I'm not mistaken. They are trying to make him sign a new contract. Yes, for England, he should be there. If he plays for Man United, he should be there. If he plays for Arsenal, Real Madrid, it doesn't matter. But I'm looking at this kid and I'm, you're so talented. You need to look at your future and think, give it a year, two years at Man United. If, think, if they don't win trophies, if they, if they don't fix up, you should look at other places. Explore the Real Madrid, explore somewhere else. Because he's very talented, though. As talented as Marcus I would say the difference between I would say the difference between him and Rashford, though, is that Rashford was very raw at 18-19. When Maynou looks polished, he looks calm, he looks collected. And I'm just going through the comments here, and everybody's entitled to their, their, their opinion. But Hammers FC here says, like yesterday, people think he played amazing. If that, if that was amazing, uh, I think everyone needs to stop watching football. Again, if if you don't think... You're taking it out of context. Was it the greatest midfield performance of all time? No. But 23 games in his professional career, starting for England at Wembley against a top 10 opponent and bossing a midfield and doing what he did, it was an amazing debut for a player in his position. Take most of the 18-year-old English midfielders and put them into that England team and see if they can do what he did. The answer is no. Nobody is stating he, is at the, he has reached his peak. At 18, we're talking about the potential of this young man to be at the level that he's already at. Uh, Cobes here says he is another Michael Owen. He'll uh, burn out from all the games played. And I don't know who you support, but again, I, I, have, I haven't seen this conversation around Foden and Saka, and I haven't seen people talk about, you know, the fact that Declan Rice has been playing regularly since since he's early, since he's late teens. Suddenly, Man United get a player that looks like it, and he's the next Michael Owen because he's definitely going to burn out. Uh, Rahman here says, I don't understand why Terry is hyping Manu. The kid hasn't done anything this season except the goal he scored against Wolves back in January. He didn't play well against City last month. Well, you also, I would say, Rahman, you haven't watched a lot of Manchester United. Just, just go and look at the last game we played against Liverpool as a prime example. And this is where football, this is what I love about the position that, that Manu plays, is that you can't judge him purely on goals and assists because that isn't the PS the resistance of his position. He is about control. He is about knitting the midfield and the attack together. And that's exactly what he did in the goal that was scored yesterday in statistical breakdown. He didn't create that chance, but the way he delayed held onto the ball, he dropped the shoulder. He broke past the line with a quick dribble and then played a delicate ball into Bellingham who set the goal up. Now there are very few statistics that are popular that will break down what he did. You just have to use your eyes to see it. And that's what I like. It's like when Thiago Alcantara, Xavi, at their best. Now, I'm not saying he's as good as them before any of you cry, but I'm talking about it is more than just goals and assists. The stats you have to start looking at is how he maintains possession, where he wins the ball back. People don't like the word pre-assist, but I actually think it plays a part. And I used to look at Michael Carrick could do this a lot. It was that ball that breaks the line that enables the, 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 the KDB or the Bruno or the Odegaard to thread the ball through for the assist. These are the types of things that Maynou does, and he does them very, very well indeed. I disagree uh, Maynou, with Mo and the fact on. that I think he should be looking to leave Man United in the next couple of years. I think that's a bit harsh. I think he's come through their academy. He's been nurtured there. You know, they could build this whole new sort of generation around Maynou and he could be like the, the focal point for this team. And, and why not? You know, I, I don't see this kid being in any hurry to leave Manchester United at all. And I don't see why he should yeah. um, at all. I, I, I would say this. If in two to three years we are not progressing and he's, and he's built up 120, 130 games, then maybe. I think about Renato Sanchez and how good he was at 17, 18. I look at Jao Felix. I think both of those players, and I want to say they were both at Benfica. I could be wrong. The yeah. biggest mistake they both made was leaving their their home club where they were developed too young. And I think that let's just say Real Madrid came in for Manu. Now he could go there and be a success. You've seen Jude Bellingham leave Birmingham very young and be a success. But I think they are, that is far rarer. I think you need to stay where you know, stay where you're comfortable until you're 20, 21 years of age, and then potentially look to move on once you've once you've sort of matured. Mm. But I do get where Mo's coming from because 
I, again, as an England fan, if Man United is still stagnating, I don't want him to stagnate in the same way as I've seen literally every single player at my club in the last 10 years exactly. do, you know? I'm not so saying I, now. But yeah, right now, he's just got to think Man United, it's his home. He's from Manchester. He's a Manchester boy. Stay where you are. Um, the one thing that I would say about him, listening to him talk, it's always important to listen to people talk. It's like when you listen to Jude Bellingham. I'm not surprised he's made it so young. He talks like he's 35 years old, and it's impeccable. He talks with such authority, calmness, maturity. He sounds like an adult. And you listen to young men who... Sp- I've noticed one thing that clubs do brilliantly now. Football players are far more educated than they used to be. Genuinely, when I was a kid, you used to watch a footballer speak, and it was, um, yeah, maybe. Um, um, um. Now they speak... It's, it's funny enough, when you watch the American UFC fighters, people are always shocked at how articulate they are. And that's because so many of them have great college educations. Um, and I think footballers now are far more educated. I think that really does help them with maturing and, and settling. Yeah. Uh, IFL here says Mainu is average. I think he's a City fan who said that there. Yes, Rico Lewis was the best youngsters last year. Yes. Yeah. Mainu, Mainu isn't at his level. Yes, IFL. Uh, better than Henderson. The hate is real. Look, I, I don't mean this rudely. I'm not saying he's reached Le- Henderson's overall level as a footballer yet, but I'm talking technically on the ball. Henderson has never been capable of doing what we've seen Mainu do. We all know that for a fact. That, that wasn't his game. That's not hate. Uh, by Mo's logic, Saka shouldn't be at Arsenal. I said that many times. You just don't listen to me. I said if Arsenal don't win trophies in the next two years, Saka will be 24. He should explore more options. 100%. I, I literally said that many times. And actually, some Arsenal fans said, well, but he's Arsenal through and through. I'm like, okay, the career is short, 24 years old. If Real Madrid comes calling and you haven't won trophies, mm. so that means you're going backward. Why not go to a, to a bigger club, to Real Madrid? I'll, I'll say the same about my, my team. I'll say the same about any player. If you're stagnant, if you're not developing, if you're not winning trophies and you believe you're a big talent, go explore the world. Why not? Go mm-hmm. see the Real Madrids and the teams that win trophies. Why not? Why so I, I, I agree. Uh, does this lady, that's Kate, by the way, on the panel have a channel? She does. Just a girl who loves Spurs. <laughs> I've not that's been called a lady. Channel. I've not been called a lady for a long time. It took me a bit aback. That's why. That's why I was a bit shocked there. <laughs> You are a lady, Kate. You are a lady. Uh, what this is what happened to the next to Rashford, the next Mbappe. We couldn't be the next Mbappe because he's older than Mbappe. And again, I I understand that people say don't overhype, it could damage a player, and there is an element of that. But at the same time, if a player can be praised and it means they take their foot off the gas then they were never meant to be that next player because Mbappe had all the hype and he's gone to the level. And we can go through history. Rooney had the hype, got to the level. Ronaldo, Messi had the hype, got to the level. Busquets had the hype, got to the level. I'm trying to think of young players that, you know, Michael Owen as a youngster, he did get to the level. His injuries let him down in the end, but he got to the level. Lived to the hype until he went to Man United. Yeah, yeah. Well, Man United hit partly ruined him. But the point is that so many top players have had hype about them and they've achieved. Hyping someone up, it doesn't in itself damage a player. The player's response to it does. So there's an element of you need that hype around the player to see whether they can cope with the pressure. Because when you're really good and young, there's going to be hype about you. It's happened throughout the history of football and it isn't going to go away now. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it per se, as long as the hype isn't crazy. Anyone saying they see shades of skulls in him, they see shades of Sadoff in him, there's nothing wrong with that. Saying he's already as good as Clarence Sadoff, that's stupid and should be called out. But again, we have to use our brains here. Don't hate on young Mainu for that, because some dude with no face and no name on Twitter has put it out there. Mainu's not paying him to say that. It doesn't make, do you know what I'm saying? It's like if someone turns around and says, I don't know, Saka's better than Mbappe. It's not Saka's fault. Saka ain't done anything. He did that, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a bit, maybe I'm a bit old school like that. But, but, is they, a bit crazy but, but we know Arsenal fans wouldn't trade Saka for Mbappe. That's... <laughs> some have said that. Well, we know that some but Chelsea for real, fans... bro. That's, that's actually a real statement. That's no way. That. There's no way. Listen, someone you, be... literally said that they were no like Saka way. through and through. I wouldn't trade him for Mbappe. Saka is my guy. He's Arsenal <laughs> through and through. I wouldn't. Was trade it him for ego? Mbappe. 
I think just people get attached to players too Igal much. Would not, sort of Igal get... would not say that. Igal is a lot of things, but he is not mad. Uh, Manitz, Manitz here says, um, uh, it won't happen, but I would love to steal Manu from Man United. Revenge for RVP. Listen, if Arsenal keep progressing and start winning the major trophies and we don't, then nothing's impossible. But listen, he's going to be a very... Listen, if, if Caicedo was sold for 100 and plus million, you're looking at similar now for, for Manu straight away, like 100... He's, he'll be ridiculously expensive if he keeps progressing. But yeah, I don't see him going to Arsenal any time soon. What about Jones and Elliot this season, 20 and 23? They're good players. They're good players. Um, Jones, I think, would have been in this England squad if he hadn't got injured. Elliot is a more advanced player. The problem Elliot's got is I don't see Elliot as an out and out central midfielder like a Rice or a Mainu or a Jones. He plays further up and he's competing against Jude Bellingham. He's competing against Saka and Foden and, and Cole Palmer. And I don't think he's as good as those players. Uh, James Madison, I don't think he's as good as those individuals. So the Elliot and Mainu conversation is ridiculous because they play different positions within the midfield spectrum. So yeah, it's it's a, yeah, a non. Before we move on, actually, the thought, the problem with with Kobe Mino performing like this is that Phil Foden and Saka they're gonna share one position because Jude Bellingham is unshiftable. He cannot shift Jude Bellingham. Declan Rice, it's gonna be Kobe Mino, and uh, who's gonna play on the right side? It's gonna be Saka or Foden. So no, I think Foden really I think have Foden, a place in the no, team. Or Foden's, gonna play Foden, on the left? Foden, Foden's gonna start on the left. And we know yeah. that because we could tell that, by the way, Rashford was very sparingly used, didn't even come on yesterday. Foden, for me right now, is earmarked for that start on that left. Saka will be on the right. Kane, striker, with Bellingham behind him. And then it'll be Rice and somebody else next to him. And it may be Maynou, um, depending how the season goes. Um, but it could be someone else. But yeah, that I think the front, barring the, the place next to Rice, I think all the other positions are set now for the start of the Euros, pending... Uh, pending uh, pending injuries, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, but viewers, let us know what you think um, and what you feel in relation to, to Mainu. Is he him? Should he be on the plane to the Euros? If he, if you're saying he's overhyped, fine. You've got to explain why and why that overhype is bad. You can't just say overhyped. It doesn't mean anything. You've got to tell us why. The why behind the what is what the football terrorist community does. Odegaard also does the pre-assist along with his GA. He does, but you can't compare Odegaard and Maynou's position. Maynou plays much deeper in the field of play compared to Odegaard. So they're they're incomparable, in my opinion. You don't compare them. They're a different type of midfield player. You've got to go like for like. You're comparing an apple with an orange. Um, so, yeah, that, I'm not saying he doesn't do pre-assists, but <laughs> he's, you can't judge him in the same way. A deep-lying midfield player has never been and should never be judged on goals and assists. Otherwise, we'd all say Patrick Vieira was crap, wouldn't we? <laughs> Some people do. But yeah, you can't you can't do that. That would be absolutely ridiculous. Speaking of ridiculousness, are we going to talk Chelsea? No, I want to talk City next, actually. I want to talk Manchester City next because this, this headline today has triggered a lot of City fans because when it comes to Man City, there is a kind of an unwritten rule that now happens online is that if it's not positive news about Manchester City, it cannot be discussed or debated. People say things <laughs> like, like the article says that Pep Guardiola has decided to quit. We're going to go into the article. Credible, verified journalists have said it. We then want to debate it, and we're called clickbait for talking about it. People have lost sight of what clickbait is, I'm telling you. it's Clickbait would be Pep Guardiola uh, left. leaves as left today and then the, the, the and then the video is about making scrambled egg that's what clickbait used to be nowadays people call clickbait when they don't like a story but it's a trending story we haven't even said we agree with it yet let's have the conversation and debate but mo you threw this our way um yeah. earlier on today and the the, the the main article is here that guardiola will leave man city amid premier league expulsion claims it says, according to reports, head coach Pep Guardiola has decided to leave Premier League uh, champions Manchester City and will not sign a new contract. This is reportedly in the article going to be in 2025. So essentially one more season left of Pep Guardiola. And you've said you've seen two or three reports like yeah. this today. Yeah, somehow it's just it's circling around. I opened my... My, my my internet this morning and I typed Man City looking for news and I want to read the news and I feel like the injury news and all the stuff 
but also the articles about this journalist that is reporting that Pep will not stay at Manchester City past 2025 because of the charges and all the stuff. And for me, I thought he said he's going to renew, but apparently he didn't only say that. He said, I can stay, but I also can leave. So he didn't give an aff affirmative answer. I see him leaving, to be honest, if they get charged. I see him leaving. I see him going somewhere else. But if they don't get charged, I see him staying, especially if Klopp is going. The problem is going to happen with Manchester City if he leaves. Who do you replace him with? A lot of these players. And I believe, like, he is one of the greatest managers, if not the greatest manager to ever coach in the leagues, in the leagues ever. Better even than Sir Alex Ferguson. Numbers don't lie. He might not be better than Sir Alex Ferguson as a coach or, or Ancelotti, but in a league, he is just amazing. So what happens to Manchester City after this? If he leaves, it's a struggle for them uh, because a lot of players go to Manchester City because of Pep. Like I believe Haaland would not have gone to Manchester City if it wasn't for Pep Guardiola and the success they have uh, with him. Like it's a, it's something that Manchester City fans and Manchester City fans. I want I want to tell you guys something. I know that a lot of you like knew the success with Mancini and Pellegrini, but the success you had with Pep is unheard of. In a short time, you win five league mm -hmm. titles at Triple. But life is not always like roses and rainbows like this. As Barcelona fans, when Leo Messi declined a little bit, when Leo Messi left, it's not always going to be like this. You have to prepare yourself. Uh, Liverpool had it in the 80s. Man United had it with Alex Ferguson. It doesn't. It's not always roses and rainbows. You have to know that. You have to understand that when we talk about it, it is something that will happen. It will happen now. It might happen in four years. It might happen in two years. You have to understand this. It's... People want to say, oh, it's fake news. I think what you guys are doing is that you're doing what makes you sleep well at night. You know, you're standing in front of the mirror and you're telling yourself he's not leaving. He's going to stay forever. He might. I'm not saying he won't. Mm. But you guys are just trying to well, accommodate. Well, the question is about it being fake news is this. Do Man City fans believe that Pep is going to stay? How old is Pep Guardiola? I don't know. What, 55? Let's know, just say 55. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm taking a guess here. 53, actually, younger than that. What age the most manager retire? 65 to 70? Do City fans think he's going to be at the club for another 10 to 15 years? First question. If the answer is no, then at some point he's going to leave. He's already been there for eight to the best part of a decade. If he leaves in 2015, that would be what, 10, 11? That'd be about nine to 10 years, which is a long stint in any era of football. The report in itself also calls something else out, which I think is really interesting. It says a well placed source. Uh, have told us that the former Bayern Munich and Barca manager could uh, also take a, a Jurgen Klopp-style break from management after a lengthy spell with the Premier League champions. And this is the one thing that, you know, has shocked a lot of people, Pep being at City yeah. so long, is that he was looked at a manager with the intensity that he manages at, that three to four years is about as much as he can do. A lot of people thought that about Klopp, and both of them have, have lasted a lot longer than people initially thought they would at Liverpool and City, respectively. But... What Fergie did, what Clough did, what Wenger did, staying in one place for basically, you know, 20 years or a quarter of a century is so unheard of. And I've seen Pep speak about this, that that for him is the most impressive thing about Sir Alex, how he maintained the energy levels every day to manage in the same place for so long. He can't fathom how that was done. So I don't think it is unrealistic. I don't believe it is quote unquote fake news that by the end of next season, Pep Guardiola could be hanging up his his whistle or his boots, as it were, at Man City. I don't think it's an obscene conversation. And, you know, someone here says, stop trying to make headlines. We're not making the headlines. The mainstream media have pushed this out. Reports are, are circulating. It's a conversation as opposed to whether or not... I, do, I, do, I, do I think this journalist knows exactly when he's going to retire? No. Do I think it could be the end of this season or next season for Pep? Yeah, I, I I do. Remember, it was this time last year. He only just signed the new deal, and people were saying that Klopp ain't leaving for many, many, many years to come, and he's now gone. I think inside the next two to three seasons, Pep Guardiola will leave, not because I'm not Tradamus, but that would take him well past a decade at a club. That is an exceedingly long time, and most managers don't last that long anywhere, and he's probably going to want a break. So I, I don't understand the controversy around... That Pep is going to leave City at some point. I don't see him saying another decade. I don't know about you, Kate, but for me, this seems like a plausible story. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think Klopp leaving 
will make Pep consider his options as well. Not not for any reason other than it. Sometimes it's just good to have a new challenge. But I agree with most. They found, get found guilty. I don't. I think they want to distance himself from it. Um, he's got a fantastic reputation. He's got a brilliant legacy. I just think City fans don't want to think that Pep's going to leave, which I get. I understand that. It's the same that Arsenal fans at one point would never have thought that Wenger would leave and the same with Ferguson. But, yeah, I just I can't see him staying for all that much longer. Um, and no matter what happens with these charges with City, whether they get found guilty or not, they're always going to be tarnished with that. You know, because there's many people who, whether they get found guilty or not guilty, will always think they are guilty. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because there's so many charges. I mean, I talk about this all the time. I, I, I'm on the fence as to whether I think they get found guilty or not. But if they don't, what does that mean for the Premier League? Because there's going to be, you know, questions about how they've managed to take it this far. And if they do, what, what does that mean for Manchester City? So, yeah, for me... I don't think it's unfathomable to think next year that he, he walks away or, like you say, within the next couple of years because, like you say, managers mm. don't stay for that long anymore. They just don't. I just don't see him staying past 2027. Uh, yeah. Which is going to be finished 10 years. However, if they found guilty, do, we, do, do you guys believe that Pep Guardiola is going to stay in coaching League well, 1 or League 2? Well, this, this year <laughs> says like, Pep said he serious. won't leave even if we're relegated. Look, I, w- I will say this. I remember Jurgen Klopp saying that he, he would quit if his team ever spent like 80, 90, 100 million pounds on players and then they started putting those bids in. Maybe that's why he has left um, uh, <laughs> as of now. But he said that. I, I've seen Fergie before say that he wouldn't sell Real Madrid a cold. He then persists to sell like, one of our greatest ever players to them. Managers say things. Circumstances change. Pep Guardiola will have a... Will, will, if he was to, If they were found guilty and then Pep Guardiola was to go, he would probably cite something different. That way it would give City fans who love him the option to say, he didn't leave because we were found guilty. It's family issues or he's exhausted and he needs a rest or he's got mental health problems or whatever else it may be. It will be something else. But I wouldn't take Pep at his word that he'll stay. Pep right now probably believes they've done nothing wrong because internally they will have told him we've done nothing wrong. If it turns out, and this is only an if here, so please don't run with the if as if I'm saying it's a fact. If you're guilty of a whole 115 charges and hundreds of millions of pounds has been pumped through your football club and its titles are being stripped, including many that the manager has won himself, transfer bans are put in place, relegations potentially put in place, or multiple point deductions over many seasons is put in place, I don't see Pep staying because Pep will then also be able to say to you, the City fans, but I only said that because they absolutely guaranteed me they hadn't done anything wrong. Now all the evidence has come out and it turns out they have. Because Pep, by the way, is not in the room with these people making these decisions. He's the head coach. That's all he does at the club. He coaches and he puts input in. He's not sitting in there doing this work. So I think Pep's comments that he won't leave if we get relegated should be taken with the biggest pinch of salt humanly possible by Man City fans. Um, If I'm being honest with you, and the thing is, he's going to leave at some point. And I think it's getting closer and closer. To, to that to that happening because yeah. he's, won, he's achieved it all he's won it all look maybe you know the only time i think he stays is if there's a genuine hunger and this might come out in conversations there's a genuine hunger for him to surpass sir alex's premier league hall they go i want to get 14 i want 14 then you could maybe see him set maybe if that really burns in his belly but i think he might have other challenges i think he might want to go to italy I mean, imagine going to Italy and taking a, sorry to say this, uh, Mo, but taking an AC Milan and being able to generate a team like AC Milan that can win the Champions League again. This man could then, you know, none of us know what his motivations are. It might be national football, even though I know he's from Barcelona, so he probably wouldn't manage Spain. I know that's been said before, but maybe he has other ambitions. But this is why I say to City fans, getting angry that this is a headline, I, I I don't think it's... I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it lacks a, an air of credibility about it. I think there's Jeff genuinely, depending on what you win, a huge possibility that in two seasons, well, eighteen months' time, end of next season, Pep hangs his boots up at your club. I, I don't see why that's yeah. so strange. And do, 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 I, I know what Man City fans want. Do you want your manager to sit in a Prince conference and say, "Yeah, by the way, if we get relegated, I'm leaving you"? Just ask yourself always the the other answer. Is it, is it does it make sense? He would never say that. He's always going to say, I'm going to stick by the club. He's not going to tell his employers, 
I'm going to leave you if you get relegated. Like, he's never going to say that. Yeah, but, and Roman's saying, sorry, Mo, Roman's saying, oh, but Pep loves City. He said it and his daughters love it. Mourinho said that he loved Chelsea and he'd never manage Spurs, and he managed Spurs. And Sol Campbell said he loved Spurs and would never go to Arsenal, and he went to Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. And things happen. It's where it was ever going to – Poch convinced every Spurs fan I mean, that he idolised the club and went to Chelsea. So it's a load of crap to believe what they say. They go where the money is. It even happened with – I know he wasn't. A, he's not a legend at City, but I remember Fabian Delph. Yeah. I'm not going to leave Villa. Signs the city a few weeks later. It's it's happened, and we're fickle as football fans. I remember Liverpool Liverpool supporters were the reason that for at least five or six years that Raheem Sterling was booed around the whole country, strangely, but booed. And this, he kind of left just by saying, "I, I want to go to somewhere that I know is going to win more." And he, and he made the right decision, Raheem Sterling. It was only a year or so later <laughs> that Liverpool were tapping up um, uh, the, 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 the Van Dyke. To a point where they had to leave the deal for six months because they got threatened, and they cheered him as a hero. But hang on a minute, you were ha- you were fuming that a player was being tapped up leaving your club, and now you're cheering someone else that's doing it. It's and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but we're fickle. And pe- managers and players, for want of a better word, they do lie sometimes. Sometimes though, they don't lie direct meaning to. He may have meant it when he said it, but that yeah. doesn't mean he's going to feel that way in eighteen months' time. It all depends. Listen. It all depends what happens to his legacy. It all depends upon the potential guilt, how big it is, and the punishments. Because if, for instance, three of his Premier Leagues and FA Cups and League Cups get stripped, he's going to feel very differently about your club. And I've said this a long... And I know a lot of City fans do this whole... I heard Big Steve say it on, on, on the overlap. Men in black are not going to come down. They can't zap my memories. I, I get that. I, I think a lot more City fans are going to feel hurt by their own club if it turns out they've cheated and things are stripped away from them. They may not think it now, but it's in the, you, you know, it, you know, like ahead of time, it's hard to feel. Like sometimes I look at my kids and I'm like, I could never, I'd never be angry at you guys. I love you so much. And then they do something really bad and the anger builds up in you and you're like, oh, I never knew I could feel that way about someone that I love so much. We've all been there and done it. And you can think about it in relationships. You can think about it with friends, your children. If you can do that with the most precious people in your life, you can definitely do it with a football club. You can suddenly look at a football club in a very different light when the truth is exposed. So I'm not saying you guys are guilty either. I'm just, we're just going based on the City fans' comments. Um, Neither are you, Jerry. I don't don't know what neither are you means, my friend. I don't know what neither are. City fans can't believe it. They just can't believe it. They're too scared. You guys are too scared of oh, Pep Guardiola leaving. You're too scared of Pep Guardiola leaving. Oh, my God. You don't want to talk about it. And they should yeah. be. Uh, do, do you know why? They, they should be scared of it. City fans should be scared of him leaving because it will probably never be that good again. The same as I don't believe Man United will ever have an era like we had under Sir Alex again. Not because it isn't possible, because City have just had an era like that. But how likely is it in my lifetime that Man United get the number one and number two greatest managers of all time and dominate? How likely is it that City have another period like this? When you look through the history of football, very few clubs do this. It's a little bit easier when you're in a one-horse race like in Germany. It's a little bit easier when you're in a two-horse race like you are in Spain for those teams to dominate. But when you're in in England, there has always been... So there's, sometimes there's been two teams at the best two teams, but there's always been more teams at the helm challenging you. Very rarely do you get... You know, if it was just Man United and Liverpool, they're the only two teams that can compete, the only teams that ever compete. You'd always have these eras. But English football has proven that isn't the way it operates here. So when Pep leaves, and I agree with... A City fan said this to me on a stream about five years ago. Managers like Pep are worth 15 to 20 points a season. And I agree. I agree. Of his level. No one's as good as him. Therefore, you're taking 20 points off your total straight away. And then you've got to try and add to that again. City is still going to be a dangerous team without him, but they're not going to be as they're not going to be as formidable, in my opinion. So I get why City fans are scared of it. Don't Mo, have you don't have Messi, City fans. That's a problem. When Pep left Barcelona, he left Messi, so they were able to win another treble. They signed Neymar, they got Luis Suarez, and they won another treble. You don't have Messi. Your players are good, but again, the problem is going to be if Pep leaves. I think actually, genuinely, some other players will leave. Like Haaland might look at Real Madrid and say the dream is there. I want to go and play in La Liga. Um, some other players will leave as well. They might leave. And um, 
you guys don't understand. We rate Pep. That's why we talk about him like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not the other way around. I actually rate Pep so highly that I know that the downfall will happen after he le he leaves. It's it's just inevitable. It's as he's as good as Alex Ferguson in terms of the league and all the stuff. It's as simple as that. The thing with it is, is that once upon a time, Man United fans believed that the good times wouldn't stop, and they have. Once upon a time. If you'd have told Chelsea fans you'd be a mid-table team, spending loads of money, not going anywhere, facing financial problems, that have laughed at you and called you an idiot. If you'd have said to Arsenal fans in 2004, in the summer, you could go 20 years now without winning the league, that have said you're a fool. If you'd have said to Liverpool fans at the late 80s, early 90s, that you're going to go 30 years without winning a Premier League and just one Champions League in... In, 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 in a 30-year period between the two, obviously the, they got the one in 2018 and the other one was in the, the late 80s. They'd have said to you at that point in the late 80s, you're an idiot. The fact that this has happened so many times, there's no way Forrest and Villa and teams like this would have ever thought they were where they were. If you'd have gone back, if you go back to the 60s and grab a load of Spurs fans who had just done the, the first team ever to do a double, winning European trophies, if you'd have said, literally, you're barely going to win anything for the next three quarters of a century, you would have been laughed at. So this idea that City are not going to have a type of regression or win less after you lose who you say is the greatest manager of all time, is, is, is the, the, the likelihood of you getting two managers back-to-back that -back were as good as Pep is nigh on impossible. Nobody and I think I, step anyway. yeah. So I do, I do, yeah. So I do understand why um, that they're, they're scared. Uh, if Pep leaves, leaves before City are convicted, will Pep be called a, as called as a fugitive? <laughs> he's not making the decision. He's not the one who's paying. I don't think he actually is involved at all. As a manager, I don't think he's involved. But, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think either. Uh, this year from Chris says, uh, I can see Pep moving on to win trophies in another league. I think he wants success in every top league. He yeah, was going to Juventus before they got charged with the uh, cooking the books again. There we go. I mean, again, I've all, I always like the idea of seeing Pep go to somewhere like AC Milan because AC Milan have had some, if they could get some money together, AC Milan, he builds a team that, you know, wins two or three back-to-back -back Serie A's, wins the Champions League again. Pep could then sail off into the sunset and literally, because then he's also achieved something. He hasn't done it with a small team, but he would have rebuilt a juggernaut, yeah. what, what Fergie did with Man United. And if he rebuilds a juggernaut that hasn't really been that good for a decade, he suddenly ticked every single box I think he's ticked everything that, you know, all the, yeah, but can he do this? Can he win the Champions League without Messi? Can he rebuild a team that's fallen from grace? I think there might be a bit of a motivation in him to, to sort of do that. And it's a risk. If he went to someone like an AC Milan, it would be a risk because the, the, the one big question mark over him is he always goes to the club that's already pretty, I know that City fans will show you the stats from the season before he took over. That season fell off because it was announced Pep was coming in, in my personal opinion, but He's always gone to teams that have been very well placed. I'd like to see him go to a team that maybe isn't as well placed and see. I'd like to see him do it. I really would because we all like to witness greatness. Uh, thank I you, Luke. Him, sorry, I want to see him come to Spurs and do it in a team that gives him no money with an owner like Levy. And then I'll you, say, you, well, you, he really you, is the best you, manager in the whole world. You spent 200 million. Don't say that. Don't, don't. Yeah, but leave it. <laughs> we spend it crap, Mo. Does it, see? see maybe Pep different. would change that. So, so rephrase. <laughs> yes. But you spent 200 million. Can you imagine if Pep goes to AC Milan next, wins Champions League, three Serie A's? I know what you're going to say. Then, then goes to Spurs three years, wins nothing. And then, I don't know, goes to manage. He's going to coach England, win the World Cup. Yeah, England, <laughs> England, win the World Cup. And then Spurs are the only team where do. I'd love that as well. I'd love that. Just Mourinho. for the Spurs, man. It'd be amazing. Mourinho. Uh, so Anthony, uh, sorry, Sonny here. So let's be real. Uh, City's decline is uh, it's inevitable. Just uh, reality. Different team will dominate the league uh, for the next few years after Pep leaves, or City get punished. It's time for these uh, for Arsenal to take over. I mean, Arsenal. Mo, if for instance Pep was to leave in the next season, and maybe and say Liverpool don't get the replacement to be as good as Klopp. Yeah. I mean, Arsenal are probably the best placed team to then capitalize on that and win themselves some major trophies. Yeah, but I, I don't think anybody. Listen, I don't think anybody's going to dominate the league if Pep leaves. Like dominate, like Pep. Yeah. I think it's a, listen, the best. Like people think that Alex Ferguson just dominated. Yeah, he did. But remember, in the two thousands, yes, he won a three peat. But Mourinho won two before. 
Arsene Wenger won two in 2002-2004. Ancelotti came and won in 2010. And then from 2009 until Pep arrived, which is the best part of the... I think this is the best part of the Premier League history. No team has ever won a back-to-back -back league title. 2009, Manchester United. Yeah. That so was, I don't I, think anybody's going to do it. I think that was because... I don't think it was the best part of the Premier League because our teams didn't do particularly well in Europe. I think what we had at that stage, if we look back now with having Klopp and Pep here and the previous regime and managers, I know Jose came back, but he was still not quite the same guy. I think we had a plethora of very good managers, not yeah. world-class managers. What we had in the previous eras was world-class managers who could make their teams do back-to-backs and three-peats and keep them at the very top. What we then got sort of the back end, sort of, especially from sort of 2013 up until Pep did the did the repeat, yeah. you know, it was the Mancini, very good manager, Pellegrini, very good manager. But, you know, you always said Ranieri that came in and did what he did, but there was no one that was in that conversation other than Jose when he but returned. But Conte made 93 points, Terry. You remember that he won like 15 yeah, games he did, in a row. He, he did, but he did. But the one thing with Antonio Conte, and I'm still, I still look at this, is... There's a question mark over his European pedigree as a manager. Yeah, of course. And there, there is there's a question mark over his ability to keep a team winning at the top. So I think he's I think he's in that category of very good manager. There's no, nothing not, that Conte not there's, there's nothing that Conte has done in his career that puts him in the conversation for top 20 managers of all time. Where yeah. the Wengers, the Fergies, the Jose's in his pomp first time round, the Peps potentially clops they're all in that debate to become and you're, you're talking about putting them in there with the johan Cruyffs and the and the and, and the like like the greatest of the great uh that, that go into that so yeah i think that's why that era and we might then go for another period like that you know if pep and Klopp disappeared tomorrow and all the same managers that are here now just stayed you could actually spurs could win the league title man united could win the league title even as we are now because suddenly the greatness has gone and you're just talking about very good managers and it becomes slightly easier in that environment to win because you're not going up against yeah, a team yeah. with a manager who is of just greatness. And we kind of know that if you look at the teams that were in title races and the teams that were looked at as really good prior to these two versus now, even teams like teams were coming third with 79 well, points. Rogers. Yeah. And they were considered in title races. Now mm -hmm. you're finishing 15 points behind those guys because they weren't able to maintain it. And yeah, only great happen, managers yeah, can. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, Pep, Guardiola. Yeah. Pep Guardiola did that for La Liga. So remember La Liga mm -hmm. when Pep Guardiola was there in 2008, 2009. Mourinho said they had to get like a 99 points to win the league. Pep Guardiola does that. But then once he leaves, it goes back to 80 something points. It goes back to back and forth, mm -hmm. even with good managers. I believe because he is the ultimate league manager in the history of the sport. He's the ultimate league manager. He is someone who builds a machine in the league. And just it, the machine keeps going again. It's 17, yeah, 18 he's, team. He's, fan, he's fantastic. And a few people were saying Arteta could be that guy. Look, Arteta could be, but he's got to yeah. win the trophies to be First. seen as that guy. He's got to start winning. Listen, if he wins the Premier League this year, retains it the year after, whilst winning a Champions League, listen, I've always said I maybe got to recategorize it from the word great, but growing up all my life, great managers have got to do one of two, uh, have got to do these things win back to back league titles, so defend their title. And they've got to win a Champions League. The only manager that I kind of put the caveat on that with has been um, Clough and Ancelotti. And that's because Ancelotti's won so many Champions Leagues and Clough won back-to-back -back Champions League. So there's always a caveat to it, but you've essentially got to defend one of your great tr trophies. That's and why you've Arsene got to... Wenger is not one of them then. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Wenger for me goes into a category. Again, that's why Second, maybe, I've, maybe I've got to change it from greatness to... I don't know, God level or or, or, or or the elite level. Like Wenger's the level below because he created great teams. He was an influencer. His style of football was beautiful. The dietary stuff, the invincible season. But I've been saying this since, I, I don't know what year it was, but I remember talking to my friends about this at school. So you're talking easily uh, late 90s, early, early noughties. I was like, there's got to be, I've always been like this. There's got to be a gateway to it. You've got to have achieved something. And for me, it's always been retaining your league title and winning the Champions League. If you don't have those things on your CV, because you've got, if you want to be in greatness, there's got to be a really high bar to be in the greatness camp. It can't just be having won a league title and having some good records within it, because suddenly there's a lot of people sitting on the great table. And I like it to be kept as, I like it to have be, I want the, the membership to be as small as possible.
if, if that makes it's like at my it own club. Small. It's very small it's in the history. Like my own club. Club. It's like at Man United. If Ryan Giggs and Scholes and Cholton and these people are greats, if you don't achieve what they achieve, you don't sit on the greats table. No one since 2013 is anywhere near legendary status at my club. Not even really at hero status because they haven't achieved what the other legends and heroes have. So I'm I'm pretty consistent with that with, with that approach to my own club. And someone says to me once, "What would um, R- Rashford have to do to sit there with Rooney's and what? Scholes's?" I'm like, "He's got to win a couple of league titles at least, and the league title, Champions League or two at least, to talk to those players. Otherwise, you're just the level or two or three below. You can't sit with them." But maybe that's just my opinion. With Wenger though, what, what about the fact that they were uh, the, the Invincibles? So no one's ever done that. Well, that's not true. In I England, you mean? Last, yeah, no, England. One, no, no. The, the one team did it before them many, many years. I think Preston did it many years ago. It could be somebody else. But I, I did this research a little while ago. The invincible record is an amazing achievement, and it deserves to be celebrated. And I, I, I never play it down. But I was looking, you know, like in the, the treble's been done. I think I'm going to get these numbers wrong because I haven't looked for a while. But I did these numbers last year. The treble has been done seven times, six times by seven teams. I think it might have been done about eight or nine times where an invincible season across Europe has been done something like 70 or 80 times by clubs. Wow. So across, across multiple leagues, so all the teams that compete in the same, in the European cups. So therefore could do a treble. It's been done many more times, not in England granted, but it's been done multiple times. I mean, by Leverkusen are, are on for it this year. And I kind of yeah. want them to do it. Cause that'd be another team that does it. And there's a lot of teams that have gone in, that have gone invincible. And I think for me, it's a case of, it, it is a great achievement, but what comes before the records within seasons? Equally, I don't look at points totals as a big thing because points totals are subjective. Is it easier now in 2024 to get a higher points total than in 1992 when your squads are considerably bigger and thicker and deeper and, and everything else now? There's teams that used to play with only one sub on the bench. How could they ever get 100 points? It was almost impossible because... They had too many games to play for such a thin squad. So I think records are important and play a part, but they're secondary to the records of winning trophies. So doing a three-peat for me or doing a treble for me is far more impressive than winning a Premier League with 110 points. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? I, I, yeah, I just yeah, see yeah. it as a bigger achievement. Actually, like for this Wenger and Mourinho thing, like to be honest with you, Mourinho came in to Wenger winning invincible season and, and, and Alex Ferguson with, at his high. And then he literally dominated them for two seasons, coming from Porto. And just people just underestimate that. This is, I think, one of the be- best things in English football that have two se- back-to-back seasons. The guy made a mockery of both of them in these two seasons. And that is bigger achievement than Arsene Wenger in, at, at Arsenal. People just don't yeah, People talk about Arsene Wenger changing English football, changing the way they play and all the stuff. But, and it's not about how, how many players. And for people that keep mentioning that Mourinho spent money, did you Drogba, for, just to you understand, they didn't sign Galactico. They signed Didier Drogba, who was at Marseille playing with Mido. Just, just think about that, Mido that played for Spurs, right? Mm. They had Damian Duff, yeah, Joe Cool, yeah, great. He had Michael Essien, who you... I don't think that they signed a player or had a player, that you as Premier League fans thought he was great before he joined them. Like, Ray Ferdinand was at lead, right? When he joined Manchester United, mm. a lot of people said that this was one of the best defenders in the league, right? Mm. Who at Chelsea that Mourinho signed, apart from, I think Joe Cole was the, the up-and-coming English guy, was the guy that we were talking about, oh my God, this guy's a superstar, a Galactico. Someone like Haaland, for example. Someone like Jude Bellingham, at Dortmund. I can't remember a name. Even Arian Robin at that time when they got him, he was still young. He wasn't Arian Robin that finished his career. That's what Mourinho built. People say, yeah, this might have spent a lot of money, but they didn't spend him in superstars. He didn't do that. Yeah. So, no, I, I totally agree. I, just, I wanted to show you this. Um, I was going to show you this on the screen, um, guys, that, talk, that shows the, the unbeaten seasons, the, the, the European ones. And some of them are, are quite dated and go back a long way. But you can see here, starting with Preston in England, they did it in the 1800s. But this is the list of teams that have gone invincible in Europe. Um, 
over the course of the last sort of century, 100 plus years. Even so, right at the top there, as you can see, is Arsenal's right, right there now. So since Arsenal have done it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. 30 teams have done it since Arsenal. And if you were to just look at their major like major leagues with Europe, the European pedigree since then, it's been done by one... So it's counting this out loud here. Two, three... Italy there, four, Portugal, five, six, Scotland, seven, eight. It's been done eight times in what you would call credible European leagues. You know, teams where you get multiple teams in the Champions League from. So I'm not I'm not playing down what Arsenal have done. I think it's great. It's rare in the Premier League, but it isn't. When you only consider that only seven clubs in, I think, the history of European football have done the treble. It's 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 a different it's a it's a different achievement because all, all the stars have got to align and you could have one more added to it this year if Bayer Leverkusen uh, end mm -hmm. up completing that achievement and so for me again as I say I'm not playing down what Arsenal have done I'm just being consistent and maybe one day I hope this happens to Man United and you'll see someone said to me Terry would you rather the FA Cup and the Premier League this year or an invincible season with just the Premier League I'm picking the FA Cup and the Premier League I want more trophies. That's why I'm saying the records in terms of the amount of trophies you win and how many you retain is more important to me than the records within winning it. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. If someone said to me now, you could do a perfect Champions League. You win every single game 3-0 throughout the whole season, the greatest Champions League run of all time, or you could scrape it but win it back-to-back -back twice. I'm scraping it for back-to-back -back twice. I'm always about the trophy more than the record that comes with it. So that's not, again, I'm not digging at Arsenal. I'm not digging at the Centurions. It's Everyone's seen this year. I'm more concerned about City doing a four-peat than I ever. Then City could get 120 points. Couldn't care less as long as it isn't in a four-peat because the four-peat is really unattainable. And the points total might be. But you, 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 there's so many factors that make it easier now to get more points than 20, 30, 40 years ago, in my personal opinion. But... um that's just my view viewers let us know what you think uh, and what you um feel let's have a little uh, look here at some of these super chats first one says the preston unbeaten season was not over 38 games that's a really good point but we need to be very careful here we need to be very very careful when we, if we want to remove that from history because it was only done over i think was 80, uh, 22 games if you're going to start removing history from the 1800s, if you're going to start removing history from sort of the er early early 20th century as well, I, I had this conversation on the space once, and I want to just go to Arsenal's record for an example here. So how far back do you go? Do you start removing Arsenal's leagues from the 30s? Do you start removing Arsenal's FA Cup from the, the 20s and 30s? How far do we go back and start removing records and trophies if you're going to discredit an unbeaten run because it wasn't over 38 games? Because a lot of the league titles, for instance, that Arsenal and Man United and Liverpool and the like have got from years gone by were won in seasons where, again, you were only playing 22, 18 games. In the 30s, you were only playing sort of eight, between 18 and 22 games per season. So you're going to remove those trophies? You're not going to. So be very careful when undoing history, because typically what you do is damage your own club's legacy. So it, it has to remain. Uh, where is Bob Paisley then? 20 trophies in nine years. Well, Bob Paisley, Bob, Bob Paisley is ranked, in, in my opinion, the top 10 managers of all time, 110%, my friend. Uh, my favorite Arsenal season was 2002, League and FA Cup doubles. I agree. I think that both the double seasons were better than the invincible seasons because you won two trophies. And again, if you could go invincible every year or win a double every year, what are you picking? You're picking the two trophies. I think it, it's self-explanatory. 100%. Uh, he won't be he won't be rebuilding Milan, but he'll be getting them over uh, the final hurdle. They need the rebuild. Come on. Like this, all the clubs, they need the rebuild in Italy. Uh, the league needs hurdle. a rebuild. The whole, the whole country. <laughs> But however, we are turning in profit. We increased 35%. We're closing in on Arsenal revenue, actually, this season, which is very strange. Oh, well done, you. Very strange. <laughs> um, Barca and Real Madrid tap up our players all the time. Coutinho, Suarez, Al Alonso, Diaz uh, is now next. Sorry, is now next. No one talking. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I did see that Diaz's dad has been talking um, uh, about leaving. And Liverpool fans fell in love with this guy. And today, there's been a lot of hate for him online. I did find that a little bit funny. I thought a lot of Liverpool fans want Diaz to go. They, they're just not happy with him. Uh, they can tell me. You guys can tell oh, me. Yeah, but it's, I suppose it's the way his dad's talking about it publicly. Uh, yeah. uh, Terry Mo, Kate, do you think Pep will take an international job? Um... Listen, I'd love him to be the England manager. I don't know if he will, but I'd love him to be England manager. Be, imagine the football we could play. Oh, Yeah, but just to be honest with you guys, Pep Guardiola, in my opinion, at some point he has to manage a, a national team and win a Euro or win a World Cup because at that time he would be probably the greatest manager ever. Ever. Winning a World Cup and what he won at club level, he would be the greatest manager ever. I know that hurts Terry, but fine. Just, I'm not listening. I didn't listen to what you said, mate. To be honest with you, I ignored it. My bro here, Tevin, uh, says, not going to lie. This is a bit uh, uh, played down, but it's all opinions. We have played the second most games on the list behind an Israel team with 39 games. I hear you, though, Terry. Our record is unique, but clearly isn't rated like that. This is the thing. It's, it's a great, like I said, it is a, I, I don't think it's, it's playing it down to say a great record. But I'm just talking about my view on the game. And you could hold me to account on this over the coming years. If my club ever goes invincible, you won't see me say it's better than Man United's treble winning season. You won't see me say that it's better than the season where we won the Premier League and European Cup double. You won't see me say it's better than the multiple years that we won the Premier League FA Cup double. So I'm not, I won't be inconsistent with it. It's hard for Arsenal fans because none, none of the rest of us in England have that, tre uh, that, that invincible. So I think you view it as... Well, you're, you're slagging us off. Where I'm not slagging you off, I would maintain, like I've said about my own club, I will not call a Man United manager great until he retains a Premier League title and wins a Champions League, no matter what he does. He won't be a great manager or a legendary manager. And the, the only problem is, is we're not winning any of those trophies at the moment for my integrity on this Tevin to be tested. So what I need you to do is hope and pray to the football gods that Man United start winning again so I can prove this to you. But... I won't I won't change it. And the reason I won't change it is because I think that's what holds the likes of Fergie in such high esteem. I will do nothing to damage the legacy of that man. Nothing. Not to win some silly debate online in 2024, 2026, like I saw Liverpool fans do last week. Football's harder now than it used to be. Therefore, Klopp winning one trophy, one Premier League is better than 13 for Fergie. What does that do to the legacy of Liverpool Football Club? It means everything you won in the 70s and 80s, which by definition now has to be even easier to win, becomes obsolete almost based on one trophy a team can win now. This is crazy talk. So that's all I'm saying, Tevin. I, I get you, though. But it is a great achievement. And that, that it is a yeah. great achievement. I'm not saying it isn't. And I'm not saying I wouldn't want one. I love an invincible season. But we're just talking about versus trophies. Now, I wanna, you before you go on, I want to ask you something. If Pep Guardiola takes over England and win the World Cup with England. And I know you're an England fan. <laughs> Would you have him off Ferguson? You I'm know, not saying for you to love him because he, he managed your rivals in the city. I'm just talking, would you have him? Because it's, winning it's, the World Cup with England is okay. it's not Brazil or Italy or Germany. I'll you know answer, I'm... I'll answer, I'll answer. If, you know, I said earlier that sometimes you'll say, no, I could never turn on my club or feel bad about them because I love them. And then it actually comes out and you do. Right now, my head is saying to me, no, I could never love Pep or, or think he's better than Fergie. But if he won my country the World Cup, I think that would change. Uh, mm. If I'm being really objective about it, I think my subjectivity would change because when we got to the, the Euros final, I was in tears. I was so happy to see my country get there. If we actually were able to win it, especially because it would be Pep, it would be won in style, right? If we were to win it in style and be the best team in the world... I probably would if I'm being completely non-biased. Yeah, I, I think it would, it would, it would, because it's, it, it's a win for me. Yes. It's a win for me, you know, and suddenly I can forget he was city manager and be like, no, actually his greatest achievement was with England. So yeah, probably, <laughs> but I'm always been someone that's been able to drop the loyalty. So when Gerard, I did this thing before I used to, when I used to get like shirts with names on every time it was the world cup or Euros, I'd get one with Gerard or a Liverpool player on just to show that, when it comes to international football, I'm, I, I, I drop my club allegiance and I support my country. Um, here, this says, uh, wait, uh, be careful about removing history. You just disregarded Arsenal's achievements by listing teams that did it, uh, did the same thing from leagues like the SPL. Again, though, 
that is not removing history. That is stating a fact. What I then also did is listed clubs that are incredible leagues that have Champions League teams in it. And a lot of the time, a lot of these invincible trophies, though, the sort of titles were, were done in generations where certain leagues were much stronger than they're seen now as well. So the Scottish League prior to the late 90s, early noughties was a very strong league that had very, very good teams in it. So all those previous ones that were achieved, and there was a number of them, they were genuine. But what about all the invincibles that have been done in Serie A, in Portugal, and, 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 and those parts of the world? So I'm not removing history. I have said it's a great achievement. I have not played it down to say that it is pony. I have not done the typical thing, Anthony, which is to say, you weren't invincible. You lost in the Champions League and FA Cup. That is not what I've done. I've simply stated that I believe winning two trophies in a season is a bigger achievement than going invincible. I believe winning a, a, a treble is a bigger achievement than winning a double or going invincible. That is not removing history. That is stating what I believe to be the bigger of two or three different achievements. It's a fundamentally different situation. I am not stating that your invincibles was easy because football was much easier back then and football now is harder. That would be removing history. That's not what I did, my friend. But thank you so much for the super chat, Anthony. I really appreciate it. Um. This uh, this here says, uh, you mean eight teams for a European uh, treble? Alati won a treble, so they yeah, won't. Yeah, add, won add to the uh, sorry. Yes, but I the teams I listed on the Invincibles, Richie, were also European teams only. So, yes, I've kept it within Europe because that is where our clubs play. I'm not going to bring teams in from nations that none of us have any kind of input into because... You don't play the same team. Not there in Europe. You play the same teams in yeah. the Champions League. Yeah, exactly. The Invincibles and Centurions are uh, admirable achievements, but they are arbitrary. You still only get one trophy. Whoever wins the league uh, is the best that season. How do you? Do, uh, how do you do? However, you do it is irrelevant. To a degree, to a degree, I I I, 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 I agree with that in terms of. You might get if next season Man United win the league and get 100 points, but the perspective is, yeah, but everybody else had a really bad year. Our points total, I'm not, and there could be truth to that. You know, the year that's the, the year that Leicester won the league, most of the top teams in England were not very good that year. So let's just imagine it wasn't Leicester that were the best team. Let's imagine it was a really good team that had a really good season. Everybody else was off it and they got high 90s or they got 100 points. It would be fair to say that the reason you kind of got so many points is because it was a poor year overall for the Premier League. So there are lots of factors that can go into teams getting that many points. So I, I, I don't believe it's not an achievement and it isn't something to celebrate. But going Centurions, for me, is not as big an achievement as winning the Premier League and FA Cup at the same time. I stand by that. Uh, for Kate, between Modric, Bale, Teddy Sheringham, Sol Campbell, which uh, hurt you the most when they left and um, which hurt uh, the least when they left? Oh, my God. Well, probably, oh, I don't know. Teddy probably hurt me the most because I just adored him. Uh, Sol Campbell hurt. They all hurt in their own way. I'm not going to say whatever one hurt the least because they all <laughs> hurt in their own way. I, can't, I don't even like speaking Sol, Campbell's Sol, name. Sol, Sol Campbell's got to be the one, hasn't it? He left on a free. You didn't even get money for him. And he went to your biggest rivals, won a double in the Invincibles. <laughs> I think I've just puked in my mouth just thinking about it, Terry. So that answers the question. I loved I it. I loved <laughs> it. Mo, what's been the biggest exit from your club that hurt? R9. Going to Real Madrid. You know what's interesting as a Man United fan? Very rarely have we lost a player that we that, that 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 we didn't weren't happy with losing. Ronaldo hurt, Beckham hurt me personally because I wanted him to stay. But it was Yap Stam actually. Yap Stam was the one because it was a mis Fergie mistake. Really, he shouldn't have reacted the way he did. We should have kept him best defender in the world at the time. That's the one that probably hurt me the most. Terry, uh, can you please educate Paul fans like Chelsea? They they won the odd trophy until the 70s and 80s um, dominance or when they got money, uh, they go on like they are united. Look, I, I don't think money is, is a sole factor. The one thing I, I, I don't throw at City is that you're only where you are because of money. You can spend money and still fail. You have to still be run impeccably well. Everyone has an era where they became the famous potent team that they were. 
At the same time, just to say that they that everything was won in the 70s and 80s, a lot of it was, but Liverpool had more trophies than anybody else in England. So I, I don't think you can say they're like Chelsea um, in, in that regard. The defending Liverpool there, my friend. I don't think we can do that. Uh, pray to see Man United back at the top. Never that, never that, my G. Uh, I thought things, uh, like things are where they are. Thank you. No, I hear you, brother. I hear you. The Invincible season was 49 games unbeaten run. I remember game 50 as well. Game 50 was on my most favorite games ever. I wasn't at that game. I was working in a pub at the time in Essex. And a lot of the residents, it was like a pub that was on like this, uh, it used to be called Kings, which was like a holiday holiday camp back in the day. But now it was like people lived there. It was like a resident, a retirement place. So all the all the heads in there were a little bit older, in their 50s beyond. And lots of them, lots of them were Arsenal fans, buying one geezer and his wife who used to sell fruit uh, in one big market in London. I can't remember which one. They were Chelsea fans and me behind a bar, a United fan. And we beat them on that day. And I've never seen a pub clear out so quickly in my life. I remember that day. Oh, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful day. Uh, Terry, loan to Arsenal cancelled. Back to United. Listen, I'm on loan. Don't you right? You can't cancel it. Uh, we won't hear the end of it uh, if it was Liverpool's invincible. Uh, Arsenal's invincible above anything I did with the United from Fergie. And, and Fergie can say that, but Fergie's opinion doesn't change my stance on football. The same as Fergie saying that isn't a rebuttal to my argument. Equally, I'm going to say this again. Don't be suckered in for the kind, considerate, professional things that people say. Paul Scholes always says everybody was better than him. That's because he's a humble person. So exactly. Alex is, is saying this because he is being humble and respectful to someone that he now calls a friend. I'm not saying maybe in his heart of hearts, he believes it. But I bet if you sat Fergie down and said, would you swap an Invincibles for a treble? He would tell you to get on your bike, you know? So, and I bet if you sat down certain Arsenal people now and you got them to be honest and say, and, and by the way, I think he said that as well in an article that was all about Wenger and his brilliance and what he achieved. So again, I, I just wouldn't take it too seriously. Um, yes, uh, but they got... They got a gold trophy. That matters most. So it is important. I'm not saying it isn't important. Who is the most successful team in England in terms of football and success in history? Well, look, Liverpool have the most amount of trophies, uh, major trophies. So you could argue they are. But I think you have to look at some things here. You have to look at Man United, who paved the way for everyone in England to play in the European Cup. The reason the Munich air disaster happened is because Man United were playing in a competition that the FA didn't want us in. They didn't like the idea of England teaching Europe its football. And they forced us to fly back through torrential weather, which led to the crash and the death of the team. And if Man United hadn't persevered, maybe no English team would play in European football. And therefore, all the European glory, the Villas and the Forest and the Liverpools and the Chelsea's and City recently have had, wouldn't exist. So you can look at those, th those areas of the game that are important. So there, there, that's me being very biased as a Man United fan. United and Liverpool are the leading two in, in this argument. There's no doubt about it. And then you've got your Arsenals. And, and and then in recent years, you've got your Chelsea's and your Cities that are part in the way in this era. So it, it, it really depends on what you want to look at. But most trophies go to Liverpool. Um, speaking of Chelsea, before the end of the show, I want to get this story in. Mad story that's come out today. Lavia out for the rest of the season. But as per my, my title of this video, I've said that Lavia has been hurt by Chelsea. Sacha Tavernieri, that's very close to the Portuguese players, has released a statement saying that in December, Lavia's comeback was being accelerated due to the technical staff pressing for his return as they needed a midfielder. But the rehab of the player was not 100% done. There were some steps that needed to be taken and the technical staff, which I believe is coaching, management, etc., Poch's team did not listen to the medical advice. The player was injured again soon after that match. He's now had further setback from this and he's going to miss the entirety of the season. I mean, this is not a good look in any way, shape, or form for Chelsea. It's just another sort of knocked on the bedpost, if you like, of major problems at the club. I will go to Kate first on this. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of good things about Chelsea at the minute, but. Do you know what? It's it's not isolated. It's come out this week that Benton Co has been playing for three weeks with a broken toe. And Tottenham players have, you know, in recent years have been playing with injuries. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if it's that I mean Chelsea have spent a billion pounds. Do they really need to bring these players back to play? I, I don't I don't really get it. I mean, Tottenham were desperate. We we rushed back 
uh, Benton Kortu soon. He's still been playing with this toe injury. Um, I, I don't understand. Is, you know, I, I, I don't get it. For me, surely, if a, if a medical team says they can't play, they're not ready, then they don't play. I, I can't understand how it's happened, really. It's just a reflection of how the club is run. It's just a reflection of how what is going on at the club. Actually, their squad is too thin. Uh, at, the, at one time, they played Ogochoku in the midfield because they had nobody available. So they they had to play. That's What happened to Romeo Labia, it just proves that they spent the money wrong, completely wrong. They spent a lot of money and they don't have a lot of players. People think that Chelsea have a lot of players. And hear this out. People look at the money and they think Chelsea have a lot of players. They have a lot of names. They don't have a lot of players ready to play. Romelu Labia was supposed to be the guy that steps in in the midfield if Caicedo and Enzo get injured or they need a break or they need a rest. But they have Ogochoku jumping in. Kona Galaga playing at the 10 because they have nobody else. It's just a reflection of how the club is run. Uh, this kid hasn't played. He played only one game this season. Shame on Chelsea, to be honest, for doing this. It's absolutely ridiculous what they did. Uh, it's more troubles for them. I feel bad for the kid. Uh, he could have had a great career if he joined, for example, Liverpool. He could have joined Liverpool and had a great mm -hmm. career. He chose the money. He chose the long-term contract. He chose Chelsea. And that's what you get. You play with injury. Probably he was forced to play with injury. Someone told him. And listen, I played football. And when you have a minor injury and your coach tells you to play, you would play. So he probably played because Pochettino... And the coaching staff told him to play. Um, this is what you get when joining a club that is in shambles. Is a club that is absolutely running horrendously. This is what you got. The guy has played less than a game this season, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of minutes. It's so is it on the coach, though? I mean, obviously, you play football. Is that down to the coach then? Is yeah, the yeah. If the, by the way, if the coach tells you to play, by the way, and, and most of the players, by the way, they would play, just to let you know. And I've been told by professional, like I played until I was 22, second division. And and even the players, for me, and I was friends with the players that played for the national team in Egypt, they say, even if my foot hurts and the coach tells me to play, I would assume he cleared it, that I'm okay to play. And that's what happens. They wanted him, Pochettino and the coaching staff told him to play. Because wow. otherwise, like the player don't make, the decision by themselves the coach has to clear it and that tells me that nobody is in the same on the same wavelength nobody thinks the same it's it's ridiculous to be honest that they like to be honest the kid has so much potential join their own club to be honest from the looking like it at now with all the problems that chelsea made the wrong decision could have joined liverpool could have been playing more at liverpool and uh, i feel bad for him but just the club is in shambles. I, I'm like, it's absolutely astonishing how a player, just one bad injury can get you out of the season like this. It's not even a major injury. It's not. It's, it's ridiculous, to be honest. Like, I feel yeah, bad. Yeah, I, I look, I sort of look at it and um, it's a certain thing. Playing with a broken toe, I kind of get, I think there are certain injuries that I think you can play through if there's a, a pain in your arm or there's, there's been a bit of a problem with the muscle. But there are certain areas, certain things that can't happen. And Man United, by the way, have been equally as bad this year. It was only just before the international break that Casemiro was complaining about a pain in his hamstring. Went to our doctors, had scans. Our doctors looked at it and said, there's nothing wrong. Cass sort of said, that can't be right. I can feel something. Went to an independent doctor, did more scans. They found a very slight injury in the hamstring, which if it had gone out against Liverpool, sprinted hard, could have snapped end of the season we've got a uh, young Malassia that's out and he's had many many setbacks this year and there's a lot of rumors it's, it's a lot that's been from bodge surgery our end we had Lissandro Martinez in the summer he had the metatarsal injury he returned he was given the all clear and we kept on seeing him he weren't playing very well at the start and then we were seeing him icing his foot all the time we're like well, what, how can it still be bad it was turned out that the bone hadn't healed properly but we didn't pick it up on the scans so th th this is where that's where I look at this. And I think to myself, if you're ignoring medical, and again, that's not seeing it. This is the other way. This is the Chelsea medical team saying he ain't ready. And the management, including Poch, for everyone saying Poch ain't to blame for anything, saying, no, we're going to play him. You cannot ignore the medical advice.
you cannot ignore it. Now, if your team is synonymous with, as I hope, uh, I can't remember what they're called now, uh, Ineos, what I hope Ineos um, fix in the summer is they fix our medical department because we've got major problems. But this the other way is just gross negligence. You've put a young player in harm's way because he wasn't ready to return him from rehab. It's crazy. Michael Owen, as far back as 2006, he'd done his cruciate ligament because he returned from his metatarsal injury too soon. Hadn't done the full rehab, which leads to weaknesses in other parts of the bodies. And this is the problem when you're rushed back from an injury too soon. It can lead to further issues, further complications, further problems. And I feel really sorry for this young man. He's made this big money move to Chelsea. He's turned down the opportunity to go to Liverpool. He was sold the dream. And listen, I have to hold my hands up. And, you know, I, I think real, 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 real men, real women, real people do this. I really thought Chelsea were going to move in the right direction this year. I liked a lot of their signings in the summer. I thought with the people they'd brought in to help run the club, the football minds, the, 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 the employment of Poch, I thought they know what they're doing. And I said, I thought there'd be a much more ferocious outfit this year, play much better football, not back in the top four, not challenging, but on their way to being back to the Chelsea that, that we've got to know in the last 20 years. But these stories don't surprise me. You couple that in with the self-reporting of misgivings. You look at the FFP problems they're currently facing, the amount of money they're currently spending and got to reduce things by. Things are not good at Chelsea right now. For, for In every single department, there are major problems. And Chelsea fans... Again, you'll get a lot of Chelsea fans online that will probably reject this story. You'll probably get a lot of Chelsea fans online that will say, no, this article's come out from Matt Law or from this Chelsea journalist that debunks what's been said. But wake up and smell the coffee. Look at where you are in the league. Look at the performances. You can't suddenly sit there and pretend that all these stories that are coming out are just PR nonsense or fake news to make Chelsea look bad. If your club was being run as good as some of these journalists are telling you it's being run, you wouldn't be where you are in the league. Hold your hands up. I know it's easier for me. I'm not a Chelsea fan. Got it wrong. I really thought you progressed this year. You haven't. There is more than just the manager's tactics at play here. And this is just another, for me, example of the problems that are currently going on at Chelsea. It's an absolute mess. And they're hurting players now. And this is, that's for me, there's one thing missing it on the medical side of things. There's one thing missing it. But Poch and his team ignoring the medical advice and hurting young players, that's unforgivable in my opinion. That's unforgivable. We've seen, we've seen it. We've seen, we've seen players take like uh, steroid shots. We've seen players take like uh, uh, morphine shots to play games and stuff like this. And at the end, you tear the muscle, you ruin the, uh, like the, you make the injury worse. Yeah, but to be honest, I just feel bad. It's just, it's just a reflection of how the club is run. It just started, and also just one more thing about this is that how desperate Pochettino is to play a player that is injured. How desperate he is to put a player in harm's way to win a game. He knew he was injured. The medical staff, based on the story, he knew. He put the player in harm's way. He was selfish. It's very selfish by him to, 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 look, at, like, to look out for himself and not worry about the player's injury. And, and look what happened now. You lost the player for a long time. He acted like a little kid. So can I ask a question? If St. Lavia had this injury now and it affected him long term with his ability to play, surely he could turn around and sue the club. Say that again, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, do you know what you'll probably find? A good point. I think what you'll probably find is that within the contracts of players, within the contracts of people, they're probably protected against this. You'll probably find it's, at some level they're protected against this type of thing. Um as in the club that is, but it's it's still not on. It's still yeah. not on at all. No, Lavia, Lavia knew he's injured. The medical team tells you in the club that you're injured, by the way. If the coach tells you you, you play, at the end, it's a decision. The player can choose to refuse, to reject, but at the end, it's a decision between the player and the coach, actually. And normally the players play. So Lavia kind of, it's, he, he wanted to play. <laughs> Lavia Jeez. wanted to play, like. What a on. shambles. Yeah, that's it's absolutely astonishing. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely... But someone should get fired, though. Yeah. And it's not the medical staff. Well, no, exactly. <laughs> Whoever done this... No, 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 don't say that. Don't say that because the Sam would be fuming. His Sam would be fuming that you say not that. Not the medical staff, but, people. I do the love that the, the, Chelsea, the Chelsea discourse is so funny because you get some people that don't want to put any blame on pot. Some that want to put all on pot. And I'm sitting there and it's like, some of it's on him. Some of it isn't. There's bigger and wider issues, but it's all part of the same problem, really. Uh, Super Chat here says, I bet his parents are pissed off. I bet everyone who's joined Chelsea is feeling His agent is pissed off. 
Probably. Everybody's pissed off. Yeah. Are Chelsea the worst run club in the world? I mean, I don't know the world because I, I don't know enough details about other clubs or about other parts of the world, but they're definitely the worst run club pound for pound in the Premier League right now. There's no doubt about it. Pound for pound, they're the worst. Uh, they only took Lavia to shove it in FSG's faces. I mean, makes, there is there is a lot of it worse. Now. Makes it worse. <laughs> makes I it know. Worse. I know. Football gods. Uh, Mo, please say my country, man. Kalon, Mohamed Kalon. Mamika, okay. Uh, when and he, he lives in there. Yeah, he's the best player from Sierra oh, okay. Leone. Actually, played against Cologne six games in three seasons, uh, home and away here in the league. I actually know Cologne personally. And uh, he, he's the one who partnered R9 at Inter in, uh, early before R9 left. He's a brilliant player, though. He's the, he was the captain of Sierra Leone for a while. He's a coach now. He did his coaching badges with Pirlo and uh, Luca Toni and all these guys. Brilliant player, though. Uh, changed the game when I played against him. Absolutely ridiculous. Imagine playing again with someone who partnered R9. Absolutely, it was ridiculous. But he told me a lot of stuff about coaches actually and about Zidane and about other people, but I won't say them here. Ooh. <laughs> uh, do, do you think that the Arsenal team underachieved in 2004? I, I wouldn't say directly in 2004, I would say that. That team underachieved in Europe because they obviously won FA Cups, they won Premier Leagues, two, you know, between in, in, the, in the early noughties, but they underachieved in Europe. They got to a final, which they, they didn't really turn up in. Obviously, it went wrong very quickly in that game with the sending off of, of, of Lehman, but that was still a mistake made by, by a player. And um, I, I would say they underachieved in Europe. They didn't underachieve in that season specifically. Uh, Wenger's career was tarnished by oil, oil money clubs. Can I stop this? Yeah. Uh, okay. Chelsea 2004 transfers when Mourinho came in. One player from Benfica, Thiago Mendes. Two players from Porto who won the league with him, center back and right back. A player from Marseille and Peter Cech from Stadrin. That's it. That's the main transfers. And Alex from Santos. He didn't sign anybody from Real Madrid. He didn't sign anybody from a big club. Uh, Arjen Robin was from PSV. He was 19 years old. So, yes, they spent some money. Yes, they spent some money. But they didn't sign superstars. At that time, no, they didn't. Just go check the 2004 transfers, people. Just go check it. I'm not lying. Just It's, it's database, people. Just go check 2004 transfers when Mourinho won the league. He signed... Three players from Portugal, if I'm not mistaken, a Brazilian player. He didn't. He didn't go and buy Holland and the best player here and the best. He didn't. Come on. Are you guys, are you guys serious, Adria? You guys comparing Adria more? Yeah, to, uh, as well. Uh, as well. Time. Listen, uh, as well as that. Look, Fergie didn't have oil money, and it didn't ruin him. He beat them in his time. Obviously, United now are losing to to yeah. City, but. In Fergie's era, in it, domestically, we maintained it. Uh, plus, unbeaten in, away in 2002. I didn't know that, but well done. That's very good. Uh, did you see who? Lamine Yamal, performance. Of the, yeah. No. You want to talk about him? Lamine Yamal from Barcelona, 16 years old, 17 years old, making a Spanish, uh, the Spanish national team, holding a, a starting position for the Spanish national team, uh, playing for Barcelona. What a talent, Laminia man. What a, what a talent. We'll hear about him. Wow. Uh, it, it's 16 years old playing for Barcelona in the Champions League. Yeah, and... younger than my son. <laughs> oh, yes. I know you. I know you. Now, you know now, what I'm talking about. The left now, foot now, of that. Now, now, now I know you mean. Yeah, yeah. sorry. I'm, I, I wasn't. I just it, had a brain fart moment. <laughs> I haven't seen Abdul in a while on here. Hope you're well, Abdul. Um, I said a few months ago he will leave next season. I'm talking about Pep. Pep. Yeah, he might do. We're getting a lot of pelters online, by the way. A lot of people online saying, I haven't seen any articles about this, Terry. Why are you making it up? I can't believe you're lying. And I'm just sort of like, well, I put it up on the think Plus, it actually, all, all it's all come from a podcast, which I'm not too sure is on it. Peter O'Rourke and a few others. And it's really funny. I find, Firstly, if you want to know what we're talking about on shows, don't tweet me. Just watch the fucking show. <laughs> Right, and then you'll see. And it's, I've noticed this with City fans recently. I've really noticed this with Man City fans more than anybody else. Whenever there's a story that goes out, it's about their club. Obviously, what we do on the terrace, we, we treat every club the same in the sense of if the headline says Chelsea are going to be kicked out of the league, we'll have a similar title, then we'll discuss that talking point 
so, and so on and so forth. But with City fans, they don't listen to what you talk about. They don't listen to your opinions on that article. They just get annoyed that it's even being discussed. Not every City fan, but a lot of City fans, they just get annoyed that it's even being discussed. Does that make sense? So the amount of people that come to me and go, Terry, why, when there's a news article that comes out about the charges, do you do a video on it? Why would I not? When it comes out, it's one of the biggest trending stories in football. Why would I ignore it and not talk about it? And what I do every show, I show you what the article says. I give you my opinions and I put the terrorist community's opinions up. For some reason, when it comes to City, it's the only team where we can't speak about news articles. But City fans all day online today talking about Gareth Southgate being the red-hot favourite to become the Man United manager when it's just a news article. No one's actually said it. It's okay when it's Man United, but if it's about City, how dare you? And a few yeah. people also not under... It's so strange to me. It's a trending topic. It's a talking point. It's a genuine news article. When we've even said on the show, I don't necessarily know if we'll leave at the end of 2025 and this journalist is right. However, City fans have got to start preparing themselves for life after Pep. If that triggers you, it's, it's just... I don't find it weird that people want certain clubs and subjects. This is the irony. They, want, they moan that we don't do enough content on City, but whenever we talk about them, it's like we have to run it past City fans first. Is this article okay for us to speak about? It's very weird. It feels very positive, strange. good, big in and blowing smoke up their asses. They'd love it. It's only because it's negative stuff. And Raman here says, Terry, you don't treat us the way you treat Arsenal. This isn't true. I clearly stated earlier that I don't ever talk about you as a money club. I never say that you've only got what you've got because money was spent. Go back and watch multiple shows where I play, where I push back against people that say that Pep's a checkbook manager. All I have ever stated is that there is massive charges hanging over you right now. And talking about that case, I'm actually really offended that so many other channels don't. And some do the whole, but we're not lawyers, we don't understand. Well, you're not football coaches. None of you have FIFA badges, but you talk about football. <laughs> do you know what I mean? None of you, none of you are, have, have journalistic. Most of you don't have journalistic degrees, but yet you talk about things journalists say. So why can't we do the same with this? I'm respectful to City, and like I've always said, if you guys are proven innocent, I will defend you every single step of the way and push back against anybody that says you are guilty. If you are proven innocent, of course you're proven innocent. Not it gets thrown out and there's this. Con you know, we've got to look at. I've got to wait to see what happens. But I'll defend you if you're innocent, 100. percent If you are proven innocent, I'll defend you. So to say I don't treat you like Arsenal is crazy. Equally, I think you're the favourites to win the league over Arsenal. How is that not talking about you in a nicer way than I talk about Arsenal? I just don't want you to win the league and do a four-peat. I don't get it, Rahman. Brother, that is not being horrible. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. What do you want me to say? I say you're the best team in the fucking world. <laughs> How can I praise you more than saying you're the best in the world? Tell me. Tell me how I can pray City more by saying you're the best in the world. I'm just, it's, it's just strange to me. Why it's City strange. fans are so sensitive, Rahman? Why are you so sensitive? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Oh, well, like, seriously, why are you so sensitive? Yeah. I know a lot, of, a lot of football fans are sensitive. Arsenal fans are sensitive. But to be honest, even on my channel, when I talk, when I talk about City, some just City fans are, some, some are very accepting of the other opinion, of the other point. But some yeah. of the City fans... I'll read it like once I open my mouth and I say, our oh, city don't look the same or this player isn't the best in the history of the sport. What? Why do you hate us? Well, it's, it's, why it's, do you hate us? I'm like, I don't hate you. I'm speaking my big, opinion. There's a big city account here that's quote tweeted out tweet for the show and said, hi, team Pep or Pep team must be Pep's official account. Uh, the Twitter guys are talking about you again. Firstly, you're a Twitter person because you've got a fucking Twitter account, which is a weird thing for you to say. Secondly, yes. And we're quoting a headline from an article today, which is one of the highest. I just checked on, on news now. It's one of the highest trending articles being read on the internet today, okay, which is a fact. And we've had a discussion about it. What is wrong with that? Like, genuinely, what is wrong with it? It's a madness to me. The other day, City fans were kicking off because I, I, I touched on an article that came out of Spain that Harlan wants to go to Real Madrid. About 10% of the City fans that watched it, fair play to you, you listened to what I said. I played it down, and I said, I thought this was nonsense talk. I don't believe it will happen. I don't believe that Haaland's thinking, well, I've got to impress Madrid to get a move. The amount of you that said, why are you even talking about this? It's nonsense. Well, I've said it was nonsense. Sometimes I talk about stories, not because I believe in them, but because I'm playing them down. 
And that's what we are. We're a community. Just think about this, you dickheads. All right, <laughs> the ones who are moaning, just think of it as when you're at school or when you're at work with your mates, you sit there and talk about things that are trending news. You just don't call it trending news. It's back of the newspaper, what someone said on TV, what your mate said to you. You sit there and talk about it. No one's, no one ever sat there at work or at school and went, Terry, I don't want you bringing up that article today about Arsenal because it's not very nice about my club. You had the debate. Why do people, for me in life, when people want stuff to be shut down, it's through some type of fear or insecurity. That's all it stems from. And I don't understand it. It is so weird. You're the best team in the world and you get worried about people discussing articles about your club. <laughs> we didn't even say it was true. It's weird to me. Very, very strange to me indeed. Um, and again, people go, yeah, but I believe it's fake news, a bad source. But I see you bantering other clubs about from the same bad sources. It's mental. Crazy. Anyway, we're, we're swiftly moving on. I want to shout out our title sponsors today. I've already finished my drink during the show. Brick House Nutrition. Been speaking about it for weeks. I'm going to keep pushing this. I'm on a really big health kick, eating whole foods, exercise again, but ensuring that you're getting the, the, the right amount of nutrition into your diet every day is absolutely key. And it can be hard with work and travel and everything else that goes on. But Brickhouse Nutrition and Field of Greens makes that more possible. It is pure organic superfoods. There is no crap, no crud. Everything is organic. It's predominantly fruits, veggies, and a few herbs that go into this. You mix it into a glass or two of water per day. Now, I'm not going to lie. It does look a bit greeny brown, no matter what flavor you get, but it does taste quite nice. If I'm being honest with you, it's absolutely amazing. And it enables you to get more than your five a day into a healthy, balanced diet. And the things that you notice very quickly is your nails grow quicker, your hair gets thicker, your skin feels clearer, you sleep better at night, because generally we're not getting enough nutrients into our diet. So even if you don't have the best diet, just have two or three of these a day, just with a glass of water, and trust me, you will start to feel better. If you don't feel better, there's a full money-back guarantee. So sc scan the QR code right there or click on the link below. Use promo code SQUAD. That SQUAD is in football squad. You get a 15% discount and free shipping. It's an amazing company. Go check it out. Uh, it's done wonders, genuine wonders for me, and not just my physical health, but my mental health as well. And one of the things, the, doctors, the doctor that created it, I was talking to him on the phone, a call cool video call and he was essentially saying that you should eat well you should eat whole food you shouldn't eat rubbish he said but the biggest problem is, is that people feel crap because they just eat they either some people eat really good or they eat crap he said if you eat okay but you drink a couple of these a day their guarantee is you'll feel better because even though you're eating a bit of bad stuff this will give you the proper nutrients so he says go and ch check it out they give you again a guarantee and the big guarantee they gave me is they said when i go for my next medical checkup is that if the doctor doesn't say that you're looking healthier, skin's healthier, now the healthier, hair's healthier, they'll give me every single penny I've spent back with them. And I spend about £80 a month. So what's that over six months? I'm bad at maths. What's that, Mo? You're smarter than me. What's 80 times 80 what? 80 times six. 48. 48. 48. There we go. 48. Basically 500 quid. So 500 quid I can get back. So go and check it out, my people. Go and get that done. Some super chats here. There's a Mo defending Chelsea. He was free. He hell's Hell freezing, freezing over. over. Freezing over, yeah. surely, bro. I'm, I'm defending the truth because people just like to, to run narratives. I'm old enough to watch Mourinho come to the league and sign drug bungees, guys. You guys just don't believe that I have. Sometimes I have agendas, right? Like it's, it's just. But for this, I just don't. Uh, Georgia in the Euros, magnificent love short story. First time ever. First time ever for yeah. that. I was right. sad to see the Welsh not make it though last night. I was sad for Wales. Yeah. We'll get over it. Uh, tell is it available in the states? Yes, it's one hundred percent available. In the, it's a, it's a, it's a, an American company. It's based in the it's based in tennis, uh, Texas. It's in Texas. It's in the greatest state in America. It's based in Texas. Amazing company, and it's all legit, like honestly, the stuff's amazing here. When you, and the thing when you look at the ingredients, everything organic, 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 organic. Of course, they powder it down to mix it into the drink, but they don't add anything to it. There's no sugar. There's no e numbers. There's no additives. It's just pure organic food. Get it done. And yes, it's available in the states. Um, uh, City and Arsenal fans are just insecure prats. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> well, why? I, I don't get it. Why? I look at it. I look at it this time. I look at it this way. 
I think that Arsenal fans want fair representation. The City one's weird. The City one's strange. I don't get why they don't like anyone talking about their club. I think they're trying to create what Liverpool had, which was like, you don't speak about us. And when you do, because, yeah, I just, I don't get it. It's all very weird to me. It's all very, very weird indeed. But there we go. Uh, look, I want to thank everybody that has tuned in. Uh, sorry, no disrespect, Terry. I'm just defending my football club. I love the football terrorist community. I'm going to defend your club, but I don't get what I've said. That's, I don't get how saying you're the best team in the world, but I do think at some point in the next three years, Pep will leave is disrespectful. I don't see how that needs... Um, uh, I, I don't see how that impacts anything. I just don't get it. I just absolutely... You know don't. what it is? It's because yeah. Pep watches the football terrace all the time and he might hear you, Terry, and think, actually, yeah, I am going to go. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, because in the back of City fans' minds, they are worried about the history being rewritten. I don't know football finance, but there has to be something. No, I do. Agree. I think that's a really good point, Anthony. I think deep down inside, no matter what a lot of City fans say up front, I think they are worried about this this case. I think they are worried. They're definitely worried about Pep leaving because no one wants this great era to end. But if Pep leaves at the same time as trophies are taken away or relegation sets in, the, no one knows the ramifications. So maybe that's why they are a little. And maybe there's an element of if nobody speaks a bit, a bit like Voldemort. If nobody speaks about it, maybe it won't happen. Maybe it's that. Um, I don't know. But there we go. Listen, everyone who's tuned in, I want to say thank you. Take care. Goodbye. God bless. As I go check out Field of Greens, pure 100% organic foods. A few people saying, oh, I don't know what that means. It just means it's grown properly. It's healthy. I'll give you an example. Things like Naked. I have this here for this purpose. Reading. This here, Naked. This is... It is about three days old now, but you know, it's like when you get certain smoothies or fruit juices, everything swells. That's because what a lot of um, companies do is they use really crap fruits and veg that's almost gone off or it's not been very well made. So when it's put into your smoothie or it's put into your juices, it's it's even though it, it could it come from an organic source, it's bad sourcing, which means it, it bloats you. It still doesn't make you feel great. This stuff doesn't do it whatsoever. This stuff is 100% organic and pure. So go and check it out. Listen, until next time, take care. Goodbye. God bless. And I'll see you all again very, very 